The Diabetologist session at ESD is very well attended and has an accompanying uh, editorial and special edition. And this year, it was on the evolution of diabetes through the life course. I've got Oliver Rando with me. It was a very well attended, very popular session. Tell me a bit more about your particular contribution. Uh, so what we study is we study uh, parental effects on obesity and type 2 diabetes. So in other words, how the lifestyle, we in particular study the father, how a father's lifestyle affects metabolic uh, traits in his children. So it's really through the generations. And, and yes. tell me a bit more about that. How? What, what's the worst thing a dad can do? Well, uh, so the, the number of things that have been shown to affect glucose tolerance in children uh, that a father can do include uh, early life stress, uh, consumption of uh, an excessive diet, a high fat diet. Uh, we study a low protein diet. Uh, and nicotine also seems to be linked to um, poor glucose control in children. So there are at least four or five different things, all of which have been linked to glucose control challenges in children. So we're all used to thinking of diabetes simply being something that appears in the life course, and it's a consequence of that life, not the life of the person who, whose sperm conceived you. That's right. Uh, and so this, the field that we're in is sort of uh, forcing a little bit of a reappraisal of that uh, in the sense that at least your parents and possibly your grandparents' lifestyles will have some impact on your tendency. Of course, the way you live will have a much greater effect on your likelihood of developing diabetes, but your parents also contribute to whether or not a given lifestyle will push you into diabetes. And do you think that this may also account why we're seeing a rising trend for diabetes? Uh, it's a possibility. Uh, so one idea actually is that um, one thing that people see is that immigrants from third world countries to first world countries, uh, their children have very high rates of diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and it's been speculated that one of the reasons for that is that their parents uh, living under conditions of hunger uh, may have inf informed their children, so to speak, uh, to hoard as many calories as they can get their hands on, and that becomes maladaptive in a world of plenty. Uh, so it, it may have something to do with, with uh, global incidence of diabetes. This is the fetal programming Correct. idea, isn't it? Yes. What else did you hear in this session? Uh, it was all over Twitter, by the way, this session, and so it was obviously extremely popular. <laughs> Uh, the, the speaker before me, uh, Emily Oaken, I believe, at Harvard, uh, spoke about um, maternal influences on diabetes, so basically the same type of thing we study, but uh, she studies it in human populations, um, and she studied uh, largely, I think, um, uh, I think it was, you know, obesity and, and high fat diet effects in pregnant women on their kids' tendency for diabetes. Uh, that was very interesting to me, and also it was a very human cohort focused, whereas we work in rodent models. Uh, the speaker after mine was uh, one I had never, I've never seen a talk like this before. He's a clinician in Germany, and his whole talk was about how to best, uh, how to best talk to governments and ministers about how to sort of change the, the rates of diabetes in a population. You know, the sort of cost benefit to intervening at school age versus having clinicians talk to their patients versus taxing sugary drinks. Uh, and so for me, that was very interesting because I go to basic science symposia, not policy symposia. And what was, his, uh, what was the takeaway from that? I mean, that's a fascinating area. Uh, I mean, he sort of went through a number of different things uh, governments could do to try to reduce the incidence of diabetes. Um, he pointed out that a lot of the ones that are very effective are the ones that are quite costly. Uh, and then he pointed out practical challenges in some of them, such as the pushback from large, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and companies like this against things like a tax on sugary drinks. Uh, so. I mean, the takeaways were he gave a number of practical ideas and then talked about the benefits and challenges to them. I don't think he gave the answer. Um, I suspect there's more than one answer. But what this does uh, bring out is that intervening early in life may be more important than we've previously thought. Yes, I believe so. 
uh, and actually that does have implications for policymakers uh, the world over. Uh, and I, I think, you know, as we think more about prevention, we've, we tend to concentrate in this meeting, I guess, more on the treatment side. But you can see year by year by year at ESD, the prevention drum is being beaten louder and louder because simply there will be too many people to cope with if we don't start to think about prevention. So I guess your work in this area is really important. Yes, well, it's, you know, I think one thing that, it, it, that might be useful about the kind of research we do in intergenerational uh, metabolic effects is that, uh, you know, a lot of people won't change their behavior for their own sake, uh, but many people will change their, or at least I would think, as a father myself, many people might be more willing to change their behavior for the sake of their children. Uh, so it's possible that this would be one additional angle to, to emphasize behavior modification strategies. Thank you so much. So there you are, intergenerational effects. Possibly something you didn't know about before, but thanks to ESD, now you do. And that symposium is available in full for you to watch on EASD.